All right, welcome to 4.7, inverse trig functions. In this section, we're going to discuss the inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent functions, and discuss how they relate back to the regular sine, cosine, and tangent functions, and how we can use the two to interact and help us solve different situations. There's a few things that we want to make sure that we have in place in order to use our inverses. To begin with, the inverse is a one-to-one -one relationship which means that for every x value there is a single y value that corresponds to it. Now parabola would be an example of something that is not one to one because for a parabola you can have two x values related to a single y value because of the square component. Now the second thing is that the inverse must pass the vertical line test which means if you draw a vertical line it crosses through the graph at one point only. And lastly the inverse represents an angle so when we're solving using inverses our answer is going to be an angle. So those are three things you want to remember moving forward. Our first function we're going to talk about is the arc sine function, which is also called the sine inverse function. To figure out how we get that function, we're going to look at sine. And notice that we have our up and down fluctuation for the sine. If I took that and turned it 90 degrees, then I would get my inverse sine. But if I kept going, it wouldn't pass the function test. So to make sure that we have a function, we're going to restrict the domain to be from negative 1 to positive 1, and restrict our range to be from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Now what that tells us, restricting our range to be between these angles, means that our answers, when we solve this, will only be in the first or fourth quadrant. If we solve the inverse sine function and end up getting something in the second or third quadrant, we can't use that because it falls outside of our range. Applying that same concept to our arc cosine function, you notice that it again, cosine goes up and down, and if I were to take that and turn it 90 degrees and not restrict it, it would not pass our function test. So by restricting the range to be from 0 to pi, we have something that is a function, and that also means that our answer is going to be in the first or second quadrant. So if we get something for the arc cosine that is in the third or fourth quadrant, we'll have to reject those answers. So finally we have the arc tangent function and to examine that we're going to look at the tangent function. So to begin with we know we have several cycles for our tangent function and if we took those cycles and rotated them 90 degrees we'd have one and then they would just kind of stack and again that would not pass our function test. So to make sure that we have a function we restrict our range to be from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 so just like the arc sign the answers have to be in the first or fourth quadrant. Anything in the second or third, we'd have to reject. All right, so we're going to evaluate the equation y equals arc sine of 1 half. Our first step when evaluating an arc sine or arc cosine or arc tangent or inverse function is to get rid of the arc component. And we can do this similarly to what we did with logs. We're going to switch our variable and our value. And when you do that, we're going to lose that arc component. So I'm going to start by rewriting this as 1 half is equal to the sine of y. And now we can evaluate where the sine equals one half on a unit circle. And that's going to happen in two places. It's going to happen at 30 degrees and again at 150 degrees. Now for the arc sine, our answers can only be in the first or fourth quadrant because of the restrictions on the range. 30 degrees is in the first quadrant, 150 is in the second quadrant, so we're going to have to reject that as an answer and accept 30 as our answer for the equation. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the arc cosine. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to switch our y with our value. And when we do that, we lose the arc component, giving us the negative square root of 2 over 2 equal to the cosine of y. Our next step is to figure out where does this happen. Where does the cosine equal negative radical 2 over 2? And this happens in two places. It happens once at 135 degrees. And it happens again at 225 degrees. 135 is in the second quadrant. 225 is in the third quadrant, and our answers have to be in either the first or second quadrant. So we're going to reject 225 and accept 135 as the answer. So that's the answer to our equation. Now let's go ahead and try this one more time for the arc tangent. Again, our first step is to switch things, switch the y with the 1, and we're going to get that 1 is equal to the tangent of y. We now want to examine where that happens. So it happens in two places. It's going to happen at 45 degrees, and it's going to happen again at 225 degrees. 
the arctangent again is restricted to the first and the second quadrant, sorry, the first and the fourth quadrant, and since 225 is in the third quadrant, we're going to reject that. 45 is in the first quadrant, so we're going to accept that as our answer. Right, now what happens if we combine the arc sign and the sign together? You want to start by evaluating the inside portion of this expression. So we're going to start by evaluating the sine of pi over 6. The sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So we can rewrite this as the arc sine of 1 half. And we'll say that that equals y. We can then rewrite this as y is equal to the sine of 1 half. And we know that the sine of 1 half happens at 30 degrees, or pi over 6. So we can see that the arc sine and the sine essentially cancel each other out, and we end up with pi over 6, or 30 degrees as our answer. And that leads us to our first property for the section. So here we can see that the sine of the arc sine of x is going to simplify to be simply x, or the arc sine of the sine of y will simply be just y. So if you pair up those two functions, the sine and the arc sine, or the arc sine and the sine, they are inverse of each other, so they're going to cancel out and you're left with whatever angle it is that you're looking at. We also want to make sure that we follow our restrictions, so our x, y is going to be between negative 1 and 1, and our angles can only be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. All right, looking at our next example, we have the cosine of the arc cosine of negative radical 2 over 2. So looking at that inside portion, if we evaluate that, we can rewrite that as the cosine of y is equal to negative radical 2 over 2. So where does that happen? Well, the first time that's going to happen is going to be at 135 degrees. So I can rewrite this as the cosine of 135 degrees, and that simplifies to be negative radical 2 over 2. So once again, the regular trig function and the arc trig function have canceled out to leave what we had to begin with, which leads us to our second property. So we can see the cosine of the arc cosine of x is just x, and we can say that the arc cosine of the cosine of y is just y. Again, we have our restrictions that x has to be between negative 1 and 1, and since we're talking about the arc cosine this time, our range is from 0 to pi. And I'm sure that you could have guessed we have the same thing for the arc tangent. Uh, the tangent of the arc tangent of x cancels to be just x, and the arc tangent of the tangent of y is going to be just y, as long as we have our restrictions. So x can be whatever we want, but y has to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay, so using what we just learned, we have the tangent of the arc tangent of 3. They're going to cancel out, and we are left with simply... 3. Then we have the arc tangent of the tangent of pi over 4. Again, those are going to cancel out, and we're left with pi over 4. Now one thing that you can kind of use as a, a cheat here or a shortcut, the outside function is a regular trig function, which means that your answer is going to be a number. For the second example, the outside function was an arc function, which means that your answer is going to be an angle. And you can use that anytime you have these. If the first function is a regular trig function, you have a regular number. If the first function is an arc function, you're going to have an angle as your answer. Alright, so now the fun stuff. What happens when we use things that aren't on the unit circle? So we're going to begin by evaluating the inside portion again. We have the arc cosine of 2 over 5. So our first step is going to be to write that the arc cosine, arc cosine of 2 over 5 equals theta. And I can rewrite that as a cosine of theta is equal to 2 over 5. Now I know the cosine is always going to be the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So when I set up my triangle, I have my adjacent side as 2, and my hypotenuse is 5. Using the Pythagorean identity, I can solve for my opposite side, which is now radical 21. The next step, then, is to find the sine of that triangle. So to kind of help us with that, I'm going to say that I want to know what the sine of the triangle is. So we know the sine is the opposite of the hypotenuse. My opposite side is going to be radical 21. And my hypotenuse is 5. So my final answer then is radical 21 over 5. So to recap here, 
we use the inside portion to help us label the triangle, and then the outside portion was used to help us evaluate the triangle. All right, so here we have another example. We're going to start by rewriting the inside portion. So I'm going to rewrite our arc sine of negative 3 over 4. And when I do that, I get that the sine of theta is equal to negative 3 over 4. Now we know the 4 has to be positive because it represents the hypotenuse, which is a distance, and that's always a positive value. So I've gone ahead and labeled my triangle. My hypotenuse was 4. I know the opposite side is going to be negative 3. And by using the Pythagorean identity, I can solve for my adjacent side as a square root of 7. So now my question is, what is the tangent of theta going to be? The tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. So I get negative 3 over the square root of 7. And if we rationalize that, we get negative 3 radical 7 over 7. One last thing to note here, uh, I've gone back and forth between the terms arc and inverse. So we have here the arc sine that is the exact same as sine inverse. You'll see them used notationally, they mean the same. Or if I say arc versus inverse, I'm talking about the same function. Uh, it's the same for the arc cosine or the cosine inverse, and also the arc tangent or the tangent inverse. They mean the same, they're just different ways to write it. Okay, so that does it for 4.7. Um, go ahead and work on the homework, and then we're going to get together for the next section.